Hey, good evening. This is Steve Conklin, Chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments, calling the regular meeting for uh, Wednesday, December 20th, 23 to, uh, 2023 to order. Uh, December 20th has great meaning in our family. Today would be my parents' 70th wedding anniversary. So uh, December 20th is a cool date in that regard. Uh, with that, uh, we will stand for the Pledge of Allegiance if you are able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. That was odd. I, I heard nobody. So <laughs> thank you all. Uh, with that, uh, Melinda, are you taking attendance virtually or do we need to do a roll call? Uh, sorry about that, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, we will do a roll call. Um, would you like to do the introduction of new members and alternates first or after? Uh, yes, please. Okay. Uh, and I would, I do not have that in front of me. So if either Mr. Rex or you, Melinda, would like to do that, that would be great. Uh, I'd be happy to, if you'll give me just one moment to pull that up. Let's see. And thank you all for joining us virtually tonight. We thought that would uh, hopefully make your holidays a little easier not having to come downtown for the meeting, so. All right, sorry, the document's opening. Okay, um, so uh, we do have two new members. Uh, we have Michelle Rogers from the city of Decono, uh, and we have Judy Kern from the city of Louisville. So welcome to our members. Fantastic. And then- uh, welcome. Yes. Thank you. And we do have a few new alternates. Um, first one is Sharon Davis from the city of Arvada. And then we have Adam Moorhead from the city of Decono. Um, we have Dietrich Hoffner from the city of Louisville. He was actually the member prior and is now uh, to the alternate position. And then we have Rachel Houtin for the city of Wheat Ridge. So welcome to our alternates as well. Fantastic. Welcome to all of you. Thank you very much. And now we will do the roll call. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. Um, and if you are not able to speak or uh, say that you're here while I'm doing the attendance, um, I will ask people to raise their hand virtually so we can make sure that we get you on the record. Okay. All right. Here we go. Adams County, Steve Odoricio. Lynn Baca, Adams County. Jeff Baker, Arapahoe County. Here. Boulder County, Claire Levy. Yep, I'm here. City and County of Broomfield, Austin Ward. Here. Clear Creek County, Randy Wheelock. George Marlin, Clear Creek County. I put it on silent. Nicholas Williams, City and County of Denver. Here. Kevin Flynn, City and County of Denver. Also here. George Teal, Douglas County. Yes, ma'am. All right, Marie Mornis, Gilpin County. Tracy Craft Tharp, Jefferson County. Yes. Lisa Ferre, City of Arvada. Sharon Davis, Arvada. Dustin Svonak, Aurora. Larry Vidum, Bennett. Sure. David Spellman, Blackhawk. Nicole Spear, Boulder. Here. Margo Ramson, Bomar. Jan Plowski, Brighton. Deborah Mulvey, Castle Pines. Here. Tim Dietz, Castle Rock. Present. Tammy Maurer, Centennial. Happy holidays, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. Uh, Todd Williams, Central City. Randy Wheel, Cherry Hills Village. Earl Holland, <clears throat> Cherry Hills Village. Susan Noble, Commerce City. Michelle Rogers, Decono. Adam Moorhead, Decono. Steve Conklin, Edgewater. Happy holidays. Awesome. Nathaniel Sierra, Inglewood. Present. Ari Harrison, Erie. Happy holidays, here. <laughs> Linda Montoya, Federal Heights. Sonia Jensen, Federal Heights. Don Cognac, Firestone. David Whelan, Firestone. 
Josie Cockrell, Foxfield. Present. Thank you. Lynette Kelsey, Georgetown. Here. Rachel Binkley, Glendale. Ryan Tushare, Glendale. Paul Hazeman, Golden. Don Cameron, Golden. George Lance, Greenwood, Greenwood Village. Dave Kerber, Greenwood Village. Chuck Harmon, Idaho Springs. Here. Brian Wong, Lafayette. Here. Jesslyn Sherzai, Lakewood. Here. Isaac Levy, Larkspur. Stephen Barr, Littleton. Here. Kyle Sch oh, there we go. Thank you, Stephen. Kat Bristow, Lockbuoy. Present. Wynn Shaw, Lone Tree. Present. Joan Peck, Longmont. I see her. I was like, I, I saw her. Maybe she's having technical yep. difficulties, but we'll get you down, Joan. Uh, Judy Kern, Louisville. Here. Holly Rogan, Lyons. Here. Colleen Whitlow, Mead. Present. Paul Sutton, Morrison. Adam Way, Morrison. Tom Mahold, Nederland. Here. Richard Kondo, Northland. John Dyack, Parker. Jeff Taborg, Parker. Let's see. Neil Shaw, Superior. I'm here. Okay. Jessica Sandgren, Thornton. I'm here. Sarah Nermello, Westminster. Here. Bud Starker, Wheat Ridge. I'm here and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. Uh, Darius Pakba, CDOT. Here. Sally Chafee, CDOT. Brian Welch, RTD. Hi, here in Centennial. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. And in chat, we do have that Steve Odoricio from Adams County is here and that Michelle Rogers from the city of Tacono is here as well. So thank you to those individuals for uh, making that note in the chat. And we will move ahead in just a moment here. And Wendy Patia from Frederick is here as well. So with that, uh, do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I would move to approve the agenda for uh, December 20th, 2023. Okay, and that was Director Teal. Thank you, Director Teal, for the motion. Do we have a second? I'll yes. second. It's Joan Peck. Joan Peck is the second. Thank you very much. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed aye. nay? And any abstentions? Thank you very much. Uh, Mayor Starker, I see your hand, but I assume that was for the motion. Actually, actually no. I had noted okay. in the uh, copy of the agenda that I got that we had, it looked like an uh, an incorrect uh, time on our meetings for January and February, and I don't know whether Melinda was able to get that uh, corrected before the um, before the minutes or before the meeting. Okay. It was on page four. My apologies, Director Starker. Um, I was not able to, but thank you for bringing it up. Okay, no, thank but you. So, uh, Mayor Starker, if your motion could be to approve, but with those changes. I uh, would uh, motion to approve with those changes. Okay, and is the second comfortable with that? Yes. Okay, and actually, I'm sorry, it was Director Teal that had made the motion, so I'm not used to this virtual thing again. <laughs> <laughs> As long as there's no objection, we will take that we have approved those with those changes being made. I don't think that's very controversial. Oh. Uh, with that, we will move ahead to the report of the chair, and we will start with a report of the Performance and Engagement Committee, which did not meet tonight, but I don't know, uh, Director Baker, if you have any other comments. No, I don't. Thank you all. Uh, we did not meet tonight. Okay. Uh, Finance and Budget Committee did meet. Director Whitlow. Thank you very much, Chair. We had two action items tonight. One was to allocate $1.6 million of additional state and federal funds to AAA contractors and to allocate $200,000 to human tr services transportation set-aside funds to selected projects. And I just wanted to say thank you very much to the members who joined tonight for the, for the, um, the Finance and Budget Committee, and I wish everyone a happy holiday season. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you for your report and thank you for your service. With that, I report to the executive director, Mr. Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Uh, I got three or four items for you this evening. The first, I just wanted to give you a quick update on our regional housing needs assessment. It's in full swing, as you know, um, and um, really more of a heads up with regards to uh, what's going to be on the calendar for the January uh, 3rd uh, uh, board work session. So um, we're going to have our consultants are going to be present and they're going to share some of their initial findings of the assessment. Um, I had an opportunity to listen into the presentation that they gave to the uh, the assessment advisory committee, and it was really data rich. And um, I think we're going to have a great conversation with them on January 3rd. So please, if you can make every effort to be there, I think you would really appreciate and be intrigued by some of the results. Um, you're more than welcome to invite invite um, staff within your communities to attend that as well. As you know, our board work sessions are virtual. So um, please, we'll... Uh, we, uh, we would appreciate all, all comers. So I'm um, looking forward to that conversation. Um, Front Range Passenger Rail District Board. Um, you Many of you will know this, and the new folks may not, but we, uh, Dr. Cog has four representatives on the Front Range Passenger Rail District Board, and the terms for two of those uh, seats are ending on March 1st of 2024. We are currently soliciting candidates, and the board will select the, its appointees for these two positions at the February meeting. Um, you should have received an invitation uh, yesterday and an application from Melinda. And uh, if you have any question, please reach out to Jacob or myself, Jacob Rieger or, or, or myself, and we'll be happy to, uh, to get you going in the right direction. Uh, third thing I want to bring up real quick is um, our SEDS, our Comprehensive Economic Development Strategy. We are in the home stretch and putting, putting on the finishing touches of the draft uh, SEDS document. Um, Flo Rotano and our staff chief presented the draft to the, the SEDS leadership team yesterday in um, in our regular board meeting uh, room. And uh, they, you know, good conversation. We had some good comments associated with, um, I believe the leadership team has had the document, at least the text of the document for, for a week or so now. And I know they provided comments. So we're, we're gonna, we're gonna take um, you know, some time and, and put the finishing touches on that and fine tune a document before you all see it um, later in January. So looking forward to getting that behind us. And uh, the last thing I want to mention is uh, winter bike to work days right around the corner. It's um, Feb Friday, February 9th. Um, we're of course well known for our summer event. It's the second largest uh, uh, bike to work day event in the country. The winter event is geared towards demonstrating that bicycle is a viable option of transportation year round, even in the colder Colorado months. Um, and uh, we have a number of folks on staff that we, they commute every day, uh, cold or not. So uh, really appreciate them uh, kind of leading the charge. But we're expecting about 5,000 riders um, and, and, and uh, we'll have dozens of, of uh, stations kind of like we do for the summer event. So um, even if you're not commuting, we would encourage you to, to, uh, try your metal, um, and ride the bike during the winter. And, and, uh, hopefully we have some half decent weather to accommodate that. So if you, if you need any information or, or, uh, uh, or, um, um, you know, have any, any questions about stations or anything related to the event, please reach out to Steve, Steve Erickson, our staff, and he'll put you in the right, right place. Um, last thing I did want to mention, I had the opportunity, golly, uh, Chair Conklin, a couple of weeks ago now um, to attend Chair Conklin's his swearing in. Um, many of you know that uh, he's the new mayor of Edgewater. And uh, I've been I've been doing this work for 30 plus years, and I've always appreciated the opportunity to be able to be there for the swearing in. Um, it's um, it. I'll tell you, I, I, I have I've, I've said this a million times, and I'm not just blowing smoke. I have so much appreciation for for the the job that locally elected officials do, um, I don't think the public will fully appreciate exactly how much time and effort it takes to do that job. So I'm so appreciative when I get you know when I get to go to one of those functions and hear, you know, the actual swearing in and what you all are committing to do. And I I from a, a from a citizen, I'm really happy that uh, that you're all willing to do what you do. So thank you very much. And lastly, I just want to wish everybody a safe and and continuous um, a happy holiday season. Um, looking forward to seeing you back in person on um, 
in January. So with that, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, Doug, it meant a great deal to have you there uh, at my swearing in. Doug also brought my block of wood. Uh, we did the block of wood uh, distribution at our last meeting, but uh, Doug brought brought mine and presented it. I really appreciated that. So thank you. Uh, one of the things we value in our meetings is the opportunity for public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment. Each speaker is limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time could be allocated to the end of the meeting to complete public comment. Uh, the chair requests there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board and consent and a Agenda items will begin immediately after the last speaker. Melinda, do we have a uh, public comment? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess we can give it just a few moments. Uh, uh, I guess at this time, I do not see any virtual hands raised. Okay, thank you very much. And again, that's an, an important part of, uh, of our meetings. Uh, consent agenda. Next item, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda, which includes the summary of the November 15th meeting and also the fiscal year 2024-27 Transportation Improvement Program amendments? So uh, moved, Mayor Stark. So moved. Okay, thank you. And do we have a second? Second. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, any discussion? So motion by uh, Director Starker, second by Director Shaw. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And any abstentions? Great, we have an agenda. Moving ahead to action items. Discussion of the draft 2023 policy statement on state legislative issues. It is that time of year. Uh, attachment C, Rich Morrow, Director of Legislative Affairs. The floor is yours. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Directors. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, you've got Attachment C, and this is the document that was presented to you last month and given an opportunity to review and make comments, and it's back this month with one additional suggested amendment that um, proposed by Director Spear on behalf of City of Boulder. Uh, do you want to speak to it, Director Spear? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to to do that. Uh, it was just a, a quick little amendment, um, and basically this was trying to get at uh, the recognizing that the direction the bills are heading, they're likely to involve some land use policies um, similar to what's stated in our mitigation action plan. And just because the housing issues that the legislature is, um, at least it sounds like they're hoping to address are closely tied to land use policies. Um, we were just hoping it could be a little more explicit about our preference on how the state would engage, engage on land use issues. Uh, basically just stating that for Dr. Cog, our preference is for an incentivization approach over a mandate approach and that this uh, overall preference extends to land use as well. Uh, thank you, and I guess we'll see if there's any other comments from the other directors. Um, otherwise, um, if there's any other comments about anything that you didn't bring up before, we can consider those too. Otherwise, be happy to entertain a, a motion. And I see, uh, Mr. Chair, I see uh, Director Sandgren's hand. Director Sandgren. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we just actually had our CML meeting last week and talked about um, some of the bills coming up. And it looks like uh, a lot of what we saw last year is being broken apart into smaller chunks. I think some of the concerns are still around the um, the the TOD areas. And uh, I don't know. I, I guess we just need to keep an eye on that again, because as we know, TOD, if RTD and the, the actual um, frequency function the way that it should if we were going to actually incentivize um, transit over vehicles. That doesn't actually happen for most of us, especially outside of the downtown area. So just keeping an eye on that, especially as it relates to that land use for the TODs. For sure. Thank you. Uh, Director Harrison, you had your hand up and then went away. Are you good? Okay. Uh, Director Levy. 
Thank you. Um, I well, I wanted to speak to another uh, very small um, amendment that I didn't submit in advance. Are you? Are we still discussing uh, Director Spears' proposal? Or I think I uh, let me know, Rich or, or Doug, if you feel differently. But I think you can make other other comments now as well. Certainly. Okay. Yeah. I um. I'm, and I do apologize for not sending this in advance. Um, on the um. Uh, in the housing section where it talks about tax relief, and it's page mm. thirty-two of the packet, um, where it talks about property tax relief to help reduce the tax liability that especially burdens low-income seniors and older adults on fixed income. Um, I wondered, if, I would like to propose an amendment that would add language that would include moderate income homeowner, homeowners in areas with rapidly rising property values. And what this gets at is um, communities where even moderate income people um, are seeing their home, uh, their property values rise to pretty uh, jaw-dropping numbers and their property tax liability were increased commensurately, uh, whereas they're they're very you know modest income people. So it would the language that I propose is um, to add after uh, low income seniors, um, uh, moderate income homeowners in areas with rapidly rising property values, and older adults on fixed incomes. <clears throat> Uh, Director Harrison. Um, what would we define as moderate in terms of homeowner, in terms of income? Would we go sure. according to what we know? Or Director Levy, did you have a thought on that or, or staff? I I don't actually. I mean, we talk about low income seniors. Um, I, you know, I don't know that these are need to be precisely defined. Someone was detected at your front door. Sorry about that. Amazon. <laughs> Director Harrison, was that enough of an answer, or would you like? Uh... Uh, well, I mean, I think I, I I agree with the with the sentiment in trying in terms of what we're trying to accomplish. Try to keep people in their homes. Um, I guess it's just a question of what we consider moderate, low in terms of those brackets, um, so that we can come up with some sort of cost or price. If I may, uh, Mr. Chair, we do tomorrow. We do have, uh, as Director Levy mentioned, references uh, in to low income without defining low. And in um, that one, it's, we already have in the existing statement uh, on the screen there, um, Increased financial support for loan and grant programs for low and moderate income housing. We haven't defined that either. So personally, I'm comfortable with sort of general understandings of, of what those mean, mean, but obviously we'll go with what the directors decide. And and I'll just say, you know, it's not, um, I, I think it's just a sort of policy direction. Um, we don't need to really parse the exact numbers or what we would any of our jurisdictions would lose in property tax revenue it's just recognizing um, the effect of the rising property values on on people who don't whose incomes aren't rising at the same rate i'll agree with that from the policy direction perspective so i'm fine okay uh director peck um yes i'm assuming that we would uh use the hud definition of a affordable and low income with the, uh, and I'm, I'm assuming moderate would be in the attainable affordable, which would be 120 to uh, 150 or 80 to 120. So um, if, if it needs to be defined, I would like to use the HUD definition of what moderate and low income is. That's good input. Okay. Thank you. Director Mulvey. Thank you. Yeah, I support this proposal. 
because there are many areas where um, those who wish to have tax relief may not garner the full support of their governing bodies to lower a mill levy as a lot of folks have encouraged to be done. And it, the rationale may be that most residents don't need it, but the rationale for the opposite is that there are many residents who do need it. And to include this kind of stipulation that there would be tax relief proposals that we can support for those who do need that relief in the moderate to low income area, it would certainly alleviate the problem that some are assuming um, for some areas that uh, there aren't people in need. So um, as we have these steadily rising taxes and increasing mill levies. So uh, I'm full support of it for that reason. Thank you. Director Spear. I think Director Nirmala may have been ahead of me. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just going based on what's on my oh. screen, but Director Nirmala, if you want to go ahead, we'll circle back. Okay. Thank you, Director Spear. Um, I, I am also supportive of, of capturing the moderate income households. I know that I would be hesitant to um, place an exact number because I feel like the state sort of and other in specific departments kind of waffle between around the definition 120 140 up to 160 sometimes so um the only thing i would you know maybe it's a simplified statement of um protecting households that are low and mo low and moderate income households that are vulnerable to displacement um if that's our main concern here um so that's just a, just a suggestion and maybe something that is consistent with how uh, we define um, the displacement issue, so. Okay, it, it sounds like on that particular issue, uh, the sentiment is not being overly prescriptive, possibly using existing definitions. Uh, Mr. Morrow has kind of said, he, at least what I heard Rich saying is that, that they've kind of got that. Uh, are we comfortable just consensus having Rich uh, add something in that deals with that, but in language that's that's helpful for them as they actually are at the Capitol actually working on this in that issue? Is that anybody object to that? I don't see any hands objecting at this point. Director Spear. Yes, I had one other thing, and I apologize for not sending this in in advance. It's on that same um, page with the, that we're seeing right now, where it says actions to provide more accessible and obtainable housing options for seniors. I'm wondering if we can just add and individuals with disabilities. This was something that came up in the study session when we were hearing from the governor's sure. office, and it's consistent with the language in other parts of the document related to transportation. Any objections to that? Okay, I see a little heart floating up there. So, uh, Director Mulvey, I see your hand. I got to put down. Sorry about that. Okay, okay. Uh, Rich, are you getting what you need from this? I, I want to be sure that that yeah. we're not confusing the issue with you. No, uh, I think I'm good. Yeah, I okay. think I got it. Okay. Fantastic. I've got a question. Do we in here have enough coverage for that one of our values is local decision making? Uh, you know, given where the state's been on some things, it just feels like maybe us expressing that that we uh, respect regionalism, but we also respect the ability of a local municipality to to make decisions for that municipality. Is that covered? Is that something that would make sense in here? I apologize if I missed it. Rich, do you Rich. know? What's it? Yeah, I'd have to go back and look through it, I think, to see. Um, I think, you know, generally we've had language that sort of kind of balances the regional decision making and the local decision making sure. respecting both of those um which is ideal 
Yeah. yeah. Uh, Director Shaw. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I would support that kind of wording that that we are in favor of local decision making and uh, and regional collaboration. If there's some sort of uh, phraseology that could be used like that, uh, if we do not al already have it. Um, it in fact, I wondered if maybe that lo local decision-making comment could have gone where uh, Director Spears' section mm. appeared. Mm. Um, I, again, not wanting to get too prescriptive in this document about what what they might approach. I love the first sentence, but I I almost think the second sentence could be replaced by something that says um, um, mm -hmm. uh, local decision-making um, should reign supreme. <laughs> well, uh, maybe, something. I'm sorry, just thinking off the top of my head here, something like where it starts out, Dr. Cox supports state policy that Re respects local decision making authority and incentivizes local governments. Yes, I like that. And then I'm I'm fine with the other. I just don't want to limit ourselves to um, state policies related to comprehensive plans or zoning codes, and then they come up with something else like, um, you, you know, it. And and then by being too prescriptive, we limit ourselves. I don't want to mm -hmm. do that. I I I really would love to broad brush. Director Levy and then Director Spear. Yeah, thank you. Um, I worry about including that language on local control. Um, just thinking back, you know, to the bill that shall not be mentioned. Um, there were some provisions in that bill that uh, that I thought made sense <clears throat> and and things areas in which I really hoped to see the legislature go farther. And this was around, um, well, the parts that made sense were about strategic priorities, state strategic growth priorities, and um, and tying funding to um, local decisions that uh, that furthered the strategic growth priorities of the state and they were around things like maximizing um, trans, uh, transit options, um, reducing congestion and vehicle miles traveled, et cetera, and then provisions uh, around um, prioritizing infill development um, instead of greenfields. And I don't know whether, um, you know, those kinds of things that say, you know, we, it, the legislature thinks this is a good way to grow and this is not a good way to grow would be interpreted as impinging on local control. So this, this is what is coming to mind for me. I think that there are some areas in which um, it's appropriate for the state legislature to provide guidance and um, that that some may seem, may um, perceive as violating that kind of principle on local control. So I think we've got a lot in here that really does emphasize incentives. And, um, and I, I do just worry about um, a blanket statement on local control like that. Thank you. Director Spear. I was actually going to um, make a, a, a plug for having a separate statement around preference for uh, local control, but Claire, I, I, Director Levy, you just talked me out of it. <laughs> so I'm going to take that back um, and just say, you know, I, I, I do, you know, I agree even in this section right here, you know, I see local pop up a few times. And so it does seem to be making that point about uh, collaboration. I mean, it, it just seems to be moving us away from this idea of mandates. Uh, 
and it certainly sounds like mandates are still a part of what we will be seeing this session. So it'll be interesting you know, where that goes. Again, I suggest local decision making as opposed to local control when we talk about this, that it's not a matter of us trying to control, but it's us, us making those decisions locally. Director Levy, I totally agree in terms of, of the things that are uh, broad vision, non-prescriptive guidance, uh, you know, where the challenge gets to be is, is when they are things that are directly affecting municipalities. And, you know, I think one of the challenges is even with the incentives, sometimes that incentive is you either do it or we're going to push you off the cliff. So uh, I don't necessarily consider that an incentive, but we'll talk about that more as we go. Uh, so I'm comfortable with, with that not being there uh, based on the conversation we just had. Any other comments before we move on? Okay, Rich, have you got what you need? Uh, I believe so, yes. <laughs> so well, if we could get a motion supporting uh, moving this forward with Rich finalizing some of those those areas and th that we are empowering Rich and staff to uh, to to align that with, with what our conversation just was. Director Shaw. So moved. You said it Director well. Sanders. Give me a second. Okay, any further discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Nay. And any, what's that? Nay. There is a nay, okay. Uh, and uh, any uh, anyone sustaining? Abstaining. Okay. Uh, Melinda, do we need to do a roll call at all with, with the uh, nay or are we, are you comfortable with, for the record with what we've got? I was able to capture it. So uh, we're okay. okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Uh, we will move ahead uh, to item number 10, discussion of the Transportation Improvement Program, fiscal year 2023 project delays. And we have a presentation from Brad Williams, planner in the Transportation Planning and Operations area. Brad? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, if you guys would like, I could share. Yeah, there we go. Can everyone see that? Yes. All right. Good evening, everyone. I'm Brad Williams, planner with Dr. Cog, and we'll be going over fiscal year 23 first year TIP project delays. The current TIP policy outlines the expectations for the initiation of project phases, including how to address delays if they happen. These delays, regardless of the reasons, tie up the limited funding available for Dr. Cog to allocate. After the end of federal fiscal year 23 in early October, Dr. Cog requested CDOT and RTD review the statuses that we've collected from sponsors over this year for projects with FY23 funding. After confirming these project statuses, Dr. Cog staff contacted the sponsors with project phases that were not initiated and therefore delayed to find out the reason for their phase not being initiated, to discover the current status of the project, and to assist them in developing a plan to initiate the delayed project phase. To avoid a second year delay, all projects identified in this report must initiate their delayed phase by July 1st, 2024. The, the attached report summarizes the project phases that were delayed as of October 1st, 2023. This report states that 35 projects are first year delayed, of which three have already been initiated and are no longer delayed. Some observations about these delays are that there are approximately double the amount of delayed projects compared to a normal year, uh, primarily due to a busier than normal call for cycle, um, which caused IGA, the IGA process to be slowed down by the increased number of projects requiring clearances, IGA execution, and amendments over the same short period of time. The other details why the projects are delayed uh, involve uh, primarily IGA slowdowns, which are uh, the reason for the delay in about half of these projects, while many others suffered from the cascading effects caused by the IGA slowdown uh, that caused slowdowns in the clearances and utility coordination processes as well. A motion to approve the staff's recommendation would allow these projects to continue. 
I would also like to thank everyone for helping us implement our new project tracking system, uh, which helped us um, be significantly more prepared heading into the delayed pro delay process by uh, being in contact with sponsors on a monthly basis and having them provide us with month monthly updates, as well as the help we normally receive from CDOT and RTD. And with that, I can take any questions on these. Thank you very much. Are there questions for Brad? Seeing no questions, do we have a motion? Um, 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 let's Mayor Starker start. Yeah, Director Starker, please. Uh, I will move to approve the um, delay um, program. Great, thank you. And Director Harrison. Second. Fantastic, thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? And any abstentions? Okay, thank you very much. I apologize for the computer buzz if you're hearing that. Uh, next item, number 11, discussion of transportation demand management strategic plan. And our presenter is Kaylee Fallon, planner in transportation planning and operations. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Chair, and good, good evening, everyone. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen if I can do so. Great. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Kaylee Fallon. I am the Emerging Mobility and TDM Planner here at Dr. Cog um, with some really exciting news, um, bringing the transportation, the final transportation demand management strategic plan um, to you all this evening. So just an overview of the TDM strategic plan, why we are doing it now, um, and, and the overall purpose of the plan. Um, so essentially, this TDM strategic plan is an overhaul to Dr. Cog's short-range TDM plan, which was adopted in 2012, um, so over a decade ago. And as we know, um, in that decade, there has been immense changes in travel behavior in our region, especially due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, as well as changes in demographics and population growth um, and changes in emerging technology. Um, and so considering all of these factors um, and considering um, Dr. Cog's internal programs and projects throughout the region, um, we have decided to develop a new um, T TDM strategic plan. So the mission statement of the regional TDM strategic plan um, is to provide transportation partners in the Denver region with a framework to improve efficiency, mobility, safety, and safety for travelers of all ages, incomes, and abilities, by identifying actions that expand multimodal travel choices, reduce traffic congestion, and improve air quality. So really want to highlight two things here. Um, I really want to highlight the um, equity component of this plan. Um, we worked very extensively with our stakeholders um, and equity groups to make sure um, that we were developing this plan in an equitable lens. I also want to highlight um, that this plan does not operate in a vacuum. Um, so this plan really supports the other um, Dr. Cog planning um, planning products, um, especially um, MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, the Active Transportation Plan, um, our recent Greenhouse Gas Mitigation Action Plan. Um, so this TDM plan really works in conjunction with the overall Dr. Cog um, planning ecosystem um, and really supports the, um, the themes outlined in MetroVision. So this strategic plan is a culmination of a total of 18 months of planning work, um, and it was created through several different avenues. Um, so the first avenue was a stakeholder steering committee was developed, um, and that stakeholder steering committee was made up of folks who work in um, transportation demand management day in and day out. 
Um, so organizations on that committee included RTD, CDOT, RTMA partners, um, the Regional Air Quality Council, um, some Dr. Cog member governments, and as well as um, ag advocacy organizations such as Bicycle Colorado. Um, so those were the folks that we met the most with and the folks that really provided in-depth feedback within throughout this planning process. We also had a larger group um, called the TDM Consortium, and those folks um, were the folks that their work is maybe not directly involved in um, TDM and transportation planning, but certainly is tangential to that. Um, so those were the folks, um, including university partners, um, economic partners, such as business improvement districts, um, some smaller and more rural Dr. Cog member governments, um, as well as some additional advocacy and equity, equity groups. Um, so that consortium we met with, as well as the stakeholder steering committee, and then in addition to um, those groups, we also held um, some focus group feedback sessions. Um, so these sessions were small groups um, made up of about four to five folks. Um, and those were broken up into several different categories. Um, we had a focus group with large employers in the region. We had a focus group um, with equ equity advocates in the region. Um, again, with bids and economic partners, um, with mobility operators, with TMAs, and with CDOT. Um, so we really wanted to get more, more specific questions and feedback with those focus groups. And again, those were um, really targeted with those smaller groups. So in addition to that um, stakeholder engagement and outreach, we also had a Dr. Cog internal staff workshop um, in order to kind of go through um, some potential recommendations and to flush out the plan. And then we also worked with a consultant. And so our consultant um, led research and analytics. They um, produced an existing conditions analysis around existing conditions and um, transportation demand management services and programs that currently exist in the Dr. Cog region, um, as well as some case studies. And then um, they also developed a um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis, a return on investment analysis, looking at the doctor, current Dr. Cog um, TDM programs and services, and then an equity analysis as well. So again, these are the, the processes, the stakeholder outreach and engagement, and the research that led to the development of this plan. So these are um, some regional trends that our consultant, as well as Dr. Cog's staff, identified that um, transportation demand management can really play a key role in addressing throughout our region. Um, and so these, these factors or these challenges include population growth, traffic congestion, safety and vision zero, transit access, ongoing impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, and of course, innovation and transportation technology. So this kind of relates back to what I mentioned earlier as to why we were doing this plan and, and why now. Um, and so these were the, the regional challenges that we identified that um, we believe that transportation demand management can really play a key role in, in solving. So there are a total of 10 strategic recommendations in the plan, um, and they are um, intended for Dr. Cog as an organization to lead and implement. Um, so it's really looking at, as an organization, what can Dr. Cog do to expand and advance our TDM work? Um, so we looked at Dr. Cog's planning work, um, Dr. Cog's policies, Dr. Cog's TDM services, and really wanted to um, see how we could move the needle as an organization. So of course, these strategic recommendations um, will need to be um, implemented alongside our regional partners, but they're really for Dr. Cog as an organization to, to take the lead on. Um, and so these recommendations fall into three categories. Again, those are the planning policy and services categories that I mentioned. So here are the first five recommendations. Um, for the sake of time, I won't read through all of them, but I do just want to um, clarify a few things here. So um, the first thing I would like to clarify is that a lot of these recommendations um, are really for further research into what that recommendation is referencing. Um, so for example, um, <clears throat> 
Number four here, consider integrating transportation demand management as a requirement to certain projects during the next update to the um, TIP policy document. Um, that is not saying that right off the bat, we are going to um, require TDM components in TIP, um, in TIP projects. That is really just, let's consider integrating it. Let's do the, the research. What might that look like? Is that even feasible? So really want to highlight that. A lot of these recommend recommendations are to take the next step and that often involves um, research, planning, and um, preparation. And it's not that we're going to be um, doing these things right off the bat. Um, so just wanted to highlight that. Um, <clears throat> So these are, um, so that is the, the one thing that I wanted to clarify here. And then um, really also just wanted to highlight that these recommendations were really taken into consideration um, throughout the stakeholder um, steering committee and um, focus group feedback. So I want to highlight the um, first recommendation here, um, prepare a white paper that explores ways to fund transportation demand management incentive programs. Um, we heard a lot from our stakeholders and especially our TMA partners um, that incentive programs are extremely difficult to fund, um, but they find that when they are able to launch those um, incentive campaigns that they are extremely effective. Um, so just want to um, highlight that we did really take into consideration that stakeholder outreach and engagement, that feedback, and make sure that we incorporated it into these recommendations. So here are recommendations six through 10. Um, I would just like to call out recommendation number nine here, expand the focus of way to go to include all trips. Um, we have definitely heard, and as we all know, um, after the pandemic, travel change and um, travel behavior has really changed, um, especially with the instance of remote work. Um, so this recommendation really came through, um, through again, that stakeholder feedback and that research recognition that a lot of the trips in our region are no longer those peak commute trips. Um, so we really wanted to find a way to address that and um, starting with expanding the focus of way to go to include all of those trips, not just those nine to five commuters um, was one of the strategic recommendations that came out of that planning work. Um, I do want to clarify that that also still includes commute trips um, just from an equity lens because we do know that um, there are folks that still go into the workplace physically, there are still folks that drive into work and there are still folks that take transit into work so um, it is still including commuter trips but it's also including um, all different types of trips. I do see that there is a hand up I'm, I'm happy to take questions now or um, wait till the end I, I'm happy to do either. I can wait till the end. Perfect, thank you. Great, so I just want to um, reiterate that the strategic plan has um, 10 recommendations and those recommendations are really intended for Dr. Cog as an organization um, to implement and they were developed through a combination of our stakeholder engagement process, um, Dr. Cog staff internal workshops and work done by our consultant. So that is the plan in a nutshell. Um, and then separate from the plan is our TDM toolkit. So this is a separate document. Um, it is intended to be a living resource for member governments and other TDM stakeholders um, throughout the region. And um, it's really intended to be a, a public facing document. And when we say living document, we also mean um, it's intended to um, be able to be updated as um, new resources and case studies are, are um, available um, as we engage in that dialogue with our member governments. So um, that is the great thing about this TDM toolkit is it will be um, a continuous process, a continuous um, conversation with our stakeholders um, and will hopefully be a really great resource um, when it comes to implementing TDM strategies. Um, and so you'll see here on the left hand side of the screen, um, these are the categories um, that are included in the TDM toolkit. So really recognizing that um, TDM encompasses a suite of different strategies. Um, we all know that Dr. Cog has done some great work on the education, outreach and marketing um, factors of uh, TDM, um, but really recognizing that TDM is a lot more than just education and outreach and also includes mobility services, mo mobility technology, um, infrastructure, parking management, roadway management, um, public policies. So um, that is a high level overview of the toolkit. And then within the toolkit, each strategy um, 
is on one page, and that includes a full description of what that strategy is. Um, it also includes context. So it includes land use context for um, urban communities, suburban communities, and rural communities. Um, it also includes context for transit access. So for communities that have no um, very low to moderate transit access, and for those communities who have moderate to high transit access, um, it also encompasses several different audiences, so we really wanted to incorporate that all trips mentality, um, and so the toolkit has um, low to high applicability for um, audiences such as residents, workers, visitors, and students. Um, really kind of wanted to hit on the fact or the point that, um, as we all know, Denver um, really does attract a lot of recreation and um, a lot of um, visitors, so we did include visitors in that toolkit. And of course, we included infrastructure as well. So um, recognizing that all the Dr. Cog communities are, are different in terms of land use, transit access, and infrastructure. Um, some T TDM strategies might be more applicable in um, some in some jurisdictions um, versus others. So um, we wanted to make sure that the toolkit was broad enough to be useful for all of our member governments, um, but not super broad that it wasn't useful. So trying to trying to find that line there, um, and I think we did a great job with that. And then. Um, lastly, just highlighting the equity part of this toolkit, we did use FHWA steps methodology um, for each of the strategies. So you will see in the toolkit, each of the strategies has several different um, equity considerations for the implementing agencies to consider. So for the sake of time, we'll not go through all the strategies, but you'll see here on the screen, here are all the TDM strategies that are currently included in the toolkit. Um, and as I mentioned before, that this toolkit is a living um, resource. It's intended to evolve. So um, these this list could grow um, as we look into the future. So we did have a month-long public comment period. Um, the public was able to um, download the draft plan, the draft toolkit, an executive summary, and an executive summary in Spanish um, on our social pinpoint site. Um, the public comment period was advertised through social media and email. Um, and so <clears throat> we did receive several comments from member governments, um, from the public at large. Um, and we did hear, uh, we did hold um, a stakeholder steering committee um, during the public comment period as well. So um, you'll see on the left hand side of the screen, just a screen grab of our social pinpoint site. There were two specific questions that folks could answer, as well as general feedback. Just wanted to run through really quickly some highlights of what we heard from public comments. Um, <clears throat> and what we heard the most of. Um, so we did hear that um, in, in regards to the TDM toolkit, there was an intelligent transportation systems strategy as a standalone strategy. And we did hear a lot from our stakeholders that um, it's more of a TDM supportive strategy and not necessarily a standalone strategy. Um, so we did remove that as a standalone strategy in the toolkit and then um, weaved ITS components throughout other TDM strategies to really make that more of a supportive strategy. So that's just one example. Um, we also heard a lot of feedback about how important um, telework and flexible schedules are as a TDM strategy. In the draft toolkit, we had that, again, more woven throughout TDM strategies, but after stakeholder and public comment, we decided to make that a standalone strategy. So you will see in the current version that it is a standalone TDM strategy. And then we also heard several comments on um, defining equity, looking at um, that transit-oriented development and mobility hubs, and then, of course, around um, concerns around transit, safety, and, and ridership. So all of this is to say that the, the plan and toolkit that were on um, Social Pinpoint, that those drafts were updated based on these public comments and stakeholder um, feedback received during that month-long public comment period. So looking ahead and something that I think um, is really great about TDM in general and this plan specifically is that um, it encompasses and supports all the work that we do here at Dr. Cog cross divisionally. So um, not only will it support other um, plans and reports coming out of our transportation and planning and operations division, but also will support the work of our communications and marketing division, our way to go team, as well as our regional planning and development. Um, really just want to end with that um, this regional TDM strategic plan really supports those five themes of the Metro vision um, 
and, and really looking forward to this collaboration across different divisions with Dr. Cog, as well as our state, regional, and local transportation partners. So with that, I have a proposed motion on the screen, but also happy to answer any questions. Director Sancred. Thank you. I, I appreciate this presentation. It's a lot of information and you do a, a really great job just um, including really almost every entity. I understand that the senior population is a separate sort of topic and, and not necessarily included in this discussion, but we do have older residents who still work and still need to get to their, you know, their doctor, the grocery store and other places. I, I guess I always wonder how do we incorporate that into this because we have we call out the safe school routes and, and we know that a lot of those students are using some of these systems, which then also overcomes um, some of the availability on, on some of it for flex ride and on demand that the seniors might be using. Is there a way to sort of incorporate because this is such a, a, a large plan. Um, how do we make sure that our seniors are still able to get to where they need to go and, and some of the software and the education and all of that is still including them because their, their ability may not necessarily be the same as what this general plan might include. And I might, my, I might not be clear on this because it's a, it's a, it's a separate topic, but it's the same topic. So I guess I look to you for that, um, how do we include that or incorporate it so that we know that it's included? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that definitely came up in discussions in the stakeholder steering committee. Um, I will do my best to answer it and then I'm happy to turn it over to other folks at Dr. Cog um, if they feel so. Um, but um, so I would say that, of course, the AAA division at Dr. Cog really really um, supports those seniors and those folks and um, their mobility challenges and getting them to um, doctor's appointments and things like that. So um, I would go back to um, the way that this TDM plan fits a, in as a piece of the puzzle of um, all of Dr. Cog's planning products and services. Um, and But I, I do think, yes, there is definitely room to, to kind of further explore um, cross-divisional work with AAA, um, with Dr. Mack, um, and so, that would be my answer to that. And I do see Jacob has his hand up, so I, I turn it over to him. Jacob. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, Kaylee's absolutely right. Let me just add a couple things to amplify a little bit. One is that we've learned in transportation planning that a plan like this, a TDM strategic plan that might be geared towards or somewhat targeted towards certain strategies for certain populations, actually, when you do those things, um, can have and often does have uh, broader applicability to um, other populations as well. And as Kaylee said, I think, you know, there are many components, there are things in here that can directly help seniors. Um, but in addition to the great work of the TDM strategic plan and the great work of our area agency on aging, um, a lot of the work that our agency does and other partners as well, um, you know, in your finance and budget committee report talked about the human service transportation projects and those sorts of things is strategies and services geared specifically towards older adults, travel training, um, helping folks access uh, rides who maybe don't have a smartphone or can't use that kind of technology uh, for ride sharing or, or those sorts of things. So there's a lot out there. So it's a really good question. Um, and it, it really takes all of these efforts and all these plans to help us do that. Thank you. And I appreciate that, Jacob. And, and thank you, Kaylee. I think it is a very encompassing, all-encompassing plan. Um, I always just want to make sure that we do specifically call out our seniors um, some of the things and I know this would also be a language barrier with some of the software programming it doesn't always come through when they're trying to book a ride a.m. p.m. I've heard a lot about this lately with our senior population especially um, and so while we don't necessarily call out that particular demographic in this particular plan if there was a way to just include them in it to make sure that we all understood that it was a part of it AAA is doing an incredible job with what they're doing. And we, we look at all of that. The funding is there. We're supporting those groups, but it's not called out specifically here, which is the only part that I guess stresses me out a little bit because we do call out some of the other groups, like I said, the, the safe schools route and, um, and the workforce. So I guess that's the only place that I get stuck on this, but I appreciate the work. It's a great presentation, a lot of information that you compiled in a very, um, you know, this specific uh, presentation here. So I appreciate the work and I don't want to take away from that at all. Thank you, Director. 
Other questions, comments? Mr. Rex. So Chairman, thank you very much. And Director Sangren, thank you for your continued support of our older adult community in our region. You're, you've been you've been wonderful through the years and, and uh, we appreciate your message. Listen, I, um, I, I had a couple things real quick. One, first of all, I wanna thank obviously staff at Dr. Cog, as well as staff in your communities, as well as staff in our transportation, our eight transportation management associations throughout the region in putting this plan together. Um, it's a lot of work, tremendous amount of outreach that was done in this. So Kaylee, you and, and others that worked on this, uh, thank you also very much. I did wanna draw uh, your attention to the toolkit itself. It is, it is, it is uh, put together as a resource for your staff Right, and um, so I hope you get an opportunity to review that. Now, I will tell you that some of the um, suggestions that are in there, um, you know, we didn't take a comprehensive deep dive into those. Um, but I, I hope you, you come away from like looking at that that it's, it's, it's thought provoking, and, um, and if there are, you know, staff within, uh, well, you and or your staff have interest in any of those um, suggested. Um, implementation strategies to please just reach out to Dr. Cog. We would help we'd love to help your staff in getting to where it is you want to be as a as a look as a local community. So I just I just want to make sure you're aware of, of that toolkit. It's pretty cool. And we do have there are examples in there, um, at least one example per strategy. Um, that kind of gives you a, a flair. And some of those are state, some of those are more national. But anyway, I just I'll leave it there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Kern, you had had your hand up. Want to be sure uh, if you still have a comment that you have that opportunity. If not, no worries. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you uh, for the welcome. I appreciate you letting me uh, join you, all of you. Uh, it's my Absolutely. privilege, actually. I um, I was curious, and, and perhaps it's one of them is not, this is not the, the, protect uh, the perfect modality for it, but one, what was the kind of participation in the, um, the public comment thing we're running into that here locally where we we talk about the public engagement and we realize that we had a really small percentage and needed to revisit our method for engaging the public to better survey people and i wasn't sure um because nothing talks about the amount or the number of people who participated and then the second one um only two so i won't bombard you too much is i don't see anything in here to help us um, create a conversation around safety um, whether that's parking safety for vehicles and um, bicycles, there's theft issues, but there's also personal safety concerns for people, like while they're waiting to get on, off and on load public transportation. Uh, I know that that's something, especially with the senior communities we were just discussing, that I um, would kind of like to help that be in the forefront of most communities as we talk about public transportation. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you for the question. And I, I see Mr. Rex has his hand up, so I'll let him go first. Well, no, I was just going to say thank you for the questions and, and appreciate you being here. We haven't had a chance to meet yet, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I, I will tell you, I, I wish you were here last month. Um, we had a presentation on um, basically safety uh, related to active transportation. So so bicycles, pedestrians, those types of things. Um, so I would encourage you to go back and just watch the video associated with that. I think it's a great idea. I said, yeah, but what you've seen the race, it's, it's, uh, it's safety and security, right, of, of various systems and the like. And I think that's a legitimate point. We will be talking a little later in this meeting about our re regional Vision Zero um, uh, program and some of the updates what we're planning on doing associated with that. Um, but safety is uh, first and foremost on our minds, and it always has been. Um, you know, this board has been quite clear about uh, the importance of our system being as safe as possible. So, um, yeah, I, I'll just leave it there, but I'd be happy to, you know, offline to have more conversations with you about it. Great. Thank you. Thanks Director Sandgren. Uh, well, if there were no other questions, I was actually just going to move to adopt the resolution. Fantastic. Do we have a second? Do we have a second? Second. Second. Director Harrison. Second. Great. Thank you very much. Went with the, the hands that I saw. So uh, any further discussion? All in favor, aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? And any abstention? Right.
Thank you very much. We will move ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation. We appreciate it. Thanks for being here tonight. Okay, moving ahead. Next informational item is uh, update on taking action on regional vision zero plan. And that's Emily Kleinfelter, planner with transportation planning and operations. Emily, thanks for being here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, hopefully everybody can see my screen all right. We can. Um, I'm actually going to, ah, I'm gonna move it over. Oh, well, sorry about this. We're <laughs> all right. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Emily Kleinfelter. I'm the Safety Regional Vision Zero Planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, tonight, I'm gonna be giving you just a little informational briefing um, an update on the strategic update work to our taking action on regional vision zero plan. Um, so just a little information. I know that I met with you back at probably, I think it was the beginning of this year now, maybe, um, uh, and <clears throat> informed you all that we were going to be taking on this work because of a couple of reasons. Um, you know, frankly, the, the trends are not moving in the direction that we want them to. Um, people are unfortunately still unsafe on our roadways in many ways. And so um, we are taking an, another look at um, the strategies and actions that we've identified and making sure that they're aligned with the national best strategies, um, such as the safe system approach. And then um, as many of you are probably familiar with, there's been a lot more funding come through the pipeline from the bipartisan infrastructure law and so um, looking at, at how ways to make sure that that informs our work that we're doing. And then lastly, just hearing from our communities that this needs to um, be more aligned with everybody's priorities and values in the region. So we decided to take on that update work. Um, and over the last 12 months or, or maybe a little more like 10, um, we really took a, a deeper look at the Vision Zero, taking action on regional Vision Zero plan. And um, when I mentioned that it was strategic, the idea here is that we were not breaking down and updating this entire plan. Um, you know, this was just adopted by you all in 2020. So it's it's a little too soon to be updating it just yet. So instead we were taking a look at chapter six, which is the implementation plan um, and really giving that more of, of a refresh. And then as well, we also had identified as creating a regional vision zero story map um, in the original ver version of the plan as one of our actions. And so um, the, we decided to take on that effort um, in conjunction when we were updating this work so that we were able to produce this vision zero story map um, that I'll give you a brief overview on in a second. Um, but that is just a really great complementary tool to the tool kit. And we are excited about having it finally up and live for the public to be able to use. It um, is a really great resource for folks to be able to break down the crash profiles in their region. So like I mentioned, we have been going through an update uh, sort of, um, sorry, we've been going through an update over the last year. And so this is sort of a breakdown of the structure in which we have been doing that work. Um, it started at first just reviewing the sort of status of where we're at on our current actions we had identified. And then over the, the last eight or so months, we did uh, each month, we would take on one of the six objectives and break down the different actions. And we would take a look at the sort of implementation difficulty and the impact of them um, and follow up with those with surveys as well to get continued feedback. And then finally in October, uh, we hosted an in-person workshop where we, I got to meet some of you all for the first time in person uh, or some of your staff. Um, and we really used that time to break down what were the, the biggest priorities for us to be focusing on, as well as what are the timelines for us to be um, putting these different actions in. So are they near-term, mid-term, or long-term um, as far as when we should be um, addressing them? Because you know, we only have so much capacity and so much funding um, at some, you know, at, at right now. So, and then lastly, after that um, workshop, we took that feedback and have been revising the document. And 
we are, it, it's currently in the hands of our communication and marketing team right now to do those revisions. And we expect to have uh, a public comment period starting in early January that will go out for 30 days. Um, it'll be very similar to the one that Kaylee put out for her TDM plan in the sense that, you know, we'll be doing social media and emails to get the word out and also using a social pinpoint site um, for folks to provide feedback on those strategic parts of the plan that we have updated. Um, and so that will be out for 30 days. And then after that, we will just have the final revisions to make to this work and then bring it back to you all in the uh, I think it's March that we aim to be coming back to you all for approval. So like I mentioned, that prioritization workshop um, was really useful and helped help me and I think everybody who participated um, feel like we were better on the same page. And I wanted to share with you some of the key takeaways as well as um, really the draft idea of what we are putting forward in that public comment period of our proposed actions for the immediate actions, as well as um, ones that we've completed and ongoing. And so, um, <clears throat> like I mentioned, the workshop, we we really noticed that the number one thing to have success in any of the work that we do um, is collaboration. And so, especially in order to make, sh make sure that these actions are implemented sustainably, if, if they need to be done that way, then we have to make sure we're in our, uh, collaborating with you all and with our other stakeholders and partner agencies. Um, another key takeaway was that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We we should really be taking advantage of existing programs or policies that are maybe in place um, and seeing how we can enhance those or um, create tools or, or other things that may complement the ones that are already in place. Um, something that you may may know well or may not know at all, but crash data is really, really important to this. Um, but we understand that unfortunately it's a big challenge for the region when we start looking at crash data um, on a regional level. And so addressing that is something that's top of mind. That's why we have hired um, a staff person who is, that is his full-time job is, is really seeing how we can address and try and find a solution to that um, challenge. But as long as we have that challenge, it's going to be something that we will just need to be aware of moving forward. Um, and then lastly, something that just was helpful for myself and I think as well for our partners is to make sure that I'm uh, there's good clarity and transparency from Dr. Cog on what is the status of the different actions and things that we're doing um, across, over the year so that when we're able to ask folks to basically tell us what is the ongoing action that they're able to reflect what they feel is is the truth and and we feel as though um they're correct with that so that was something that was a, a good takeaway for me to learn that we maybe need to be a little bit more transparent about where we're at with everything but moving forward i wanted to highlight some of the um some of the main highlights from the previous action plan these are some actions that we had identified that we have successfully completed since the adoption of the plan in 2020. So there are again, six objectives that we have um, identified. And so I haven't listed them out here for you, but I will in a later slide, you'll see them. Um, but objective three is looking at designing and retrofitting roadways to prioritize safety. And this is a really key objective for us because we know that the infrastructure is a, is a big player in safety. And so we took on the uh, creation of the Complete Streets Toolkit for the Dr. Cog region and completed that in 2021. And then this year, we also completed a prioritization analysis of that Complete Streets network, which we think is a really useful tool to help us identify um, corridors in the region that are really prime for investing funds to improve the accessibility and safety and mobility for all roadway users. Another really exciting success story from the, the Vision Zero program um, in the last couple of years is our most recent success story, which is the Vision Zero story map that I mentioned. So this is a virtual tool um, some of you may not know what story map means. It's basically just a website for you to be able to explore the, the crash data trends in the Dr. Cog region. 
So as you're all aware, Dr. Cog is a very, very diverse land use type, and we cover a lot, a lot of um, a lot of land, frankly. And so we understand that when you're analyzing the crashes in somewhere that's more urban, the types of crashes that are occurring, the users that are involved are going to be different when you're looking at other more maybe rural area types in the region. And so that's what we did here is we break down the crashes based on our four area types in the Dr. Cog region. As you see here, you got, um, sorry, it's maybe a little blurry, but there's urban, suburban, rural, and limited access highways. And then we also have behavior profiles that we break down. And uh, this is just a really new and exciting tool that we're really proud of, of putting out to the public. And we also are excited to have it be sort of a living resource that as more data, or sorry, as data becomes available more frequently and more um, more consistently, then we'll be able to update this with trends that are um, more up to date. Another success that we wanted to highlight was in line with our objective six, which is increasing support for legislation, policies, and practices um, that focus on safety at all levels. This is in relation to Senate Bill 23200 that allows for local agencies the ability to use uh, safety cameras as an enforcement technique, including for red light running and speeding. And so we are actually, I think, yes, sorry. Um, and so we're really um, excited to see the, the passing of that Senate bill and to help our local member governments um, try and deploy the use of that in a in a manner that makes sure that it's not impactful in a, in a harmful way to any sort of populations by any means. So next I wanted to cover some of the actions that we had from the previous Vision Zero action plan that are gonna be following or carrying over into the next plan um, that we feel as though we have been working on this currently and we are gonna continue working on these actions. And so, uh, the first that I wanted to highlight briefly is just the monthly Regional Vision Zero Working Group. Um, we are looking at maybe making it bi-monthly instead of monthly, just because we know that people have a lot on their plate um, and we want to make sure that people are getting the best use of their time when they come to those meetings. Um, and we're also exploring ways for that, that group to actually be a part of the ones who help implement this plan. Uh, that's really how we see that Vision Zero work group um, morphing into in the, in the future. Um, another action we will continue to work on is our participation in the statewide tra uh, traffic records advisory committee for Colorado or STRAC. Um, that's really important to the data work that we have. And I know that myself or other folks who are involved in the data work will continue to be involved in that. And in that same sort of node, um, we will continue our work uh, exploring the creation of a regional uh, regional crash data consortium and uh, looking at inventorying the needs of the region as well as trying to identify solutions. Um, another thing that we will continue doing is sharing information on funding opportunities through all of our different um, ways that we can connect with you all. And then lastly, we will continue to reevaluate our legislative priorities as new safety research arises. So next, I wanted to go over maybe some of these are new. Some of these might not be new. They may be carrying over from the previous plan. But I wanted to just highlight for each of the objectives, I was going to go through one uh, immediate action that we've identified that we in 2024 are going to, you know, hit the ground running to identify ways to get this implemented in the next zero to two years. That's the time frame that we've given ourselves for these immediate actions. Um, and so the first action is for our uh, objective number one, which is to improve collaboration between allied agencies. And so we, this is really listening to you all and understanding that um, there's a lot of safety issues that are going on in the region but um, dangerous behaviors behind the wheel um, are, are one that we really want to dig a little deeper on and bring folks together. And so we're looking at the um, convening of regular safety meetings of folks in this transportation safety space um, and folks who are maybe not normally in the transportation safety space, but do 
some in some way interact with people who may be victims of of a traffic crash. Um, so maybe it's health professionals or um, or other advocacy or community organizations, bringing them all to the table to try and understand um, a little deeper and and maybe share best practices or solutions that we found in our communities. So next up is looking at uh, objective two to increase awareness and adoption of Vision Zero. This one, um, I, I just actually before I move on to this one, I want to note that you'll you'll see that some of these have um, of much more difficulty to implement than others. And so we have identified that more in the plan when you actually see it um, all on one in one document. But right now here, I just wanted to call out for you some quick little highlights. So another one, this one is a much easier task for us to complete, but updating our Vision Zero webpage to include resources and information um, on the safe systems approach, as well as on our progress towards Vision Zero in the region. For objective three, to design and retrofit roadways to prioritize safety, we are exploring the development of a quick build toolkit for member governments to help provide guidance on the design and implementation of these quick to deliver and adjustable traffic measures that improve safety, um, especially focusing on the regional high injury network. You know, we, we hear that there's um, a need for things on the ground now, but not always maybe um, resources on how to do that the best way and how to communicate that with our community, with uh, just the, the general public on what we're doing when the quick build project comes in the ground. And so I think that this is something we heard from, from folks that would be of great use. Um, and then for improving data collection and reporting objective four, we will, this is something that's actually a continued action, but it's something that we will continue to do every um, three to five years, but we will initiate in the next year to two years, which is um, basically, the, the regional vision zero story map that you saw, we will redo that analysis work so that we can get a more up-to-date um, understanding of those high-risk actions and um, crash profiles for the region. For objective five, to increase funding and resources, we are exploring modifying the transportation improvement program or TIP um, criteria to prioritize safety projects on the regional high injury network. Um, this one is pretty self-explanatory, but it's just the exploration of um, us highlighting other criteria so that we can make sure that projects are always emphasizing safety um, and are on the high injury network. And then lastly, for objective six, we are inc for increasing support for legislation, policies, and practices that focus on safety at all levels. Um, there was a really, really high interest in looking at the support of legislation to increase funding and evaluate real allocation of existing funding to safety projects so that we have a reliable dedicated stream of funding. Um, I think that that goes without saying, it's it's understood that we need more money. There's never enough money for this work and um, folks really would like to, try, rather than just grabbing at every little bit that we can find, we'd like to try and go to the source and, and see if there's a way to advocate and um, make legislation so that there is a true sustainable pool of funding for, for safety. So um, just a reminder then, we will be going to, um, I, this is a little bit out of date. I put this together about a week ago and unfortunately things got a little bit behind track, but our 30-day public review period will be starting in January, looking to start that January 10th, hopefully, so that second week, um, once everybody's kind of shaken off all the holiday, uh, you know, laziness or whatnot, and we're going to, hopefully folks will be able to um, actually provide some feedback to that. And then lastly, we will be coming to TAC and RTC in February, then March, and then I hope to see you all again in March for the final approval of this um, update work. And I think that that is it that I have for you to tonight. And I'm here for any questions.
Thank you very much. Do we have any questions or comments from the uh, board? Director Levy. Um, there we go. Um, there you are. Yeah, no, thank you. Just a couple. Um, you know, on, on the legislative um, uh, support that, that we might get behind, and this didn't come up in the legislative priorities document, I don't believe, but I think there may be some legislation to uh, require driver's ed classes um, for for youth uh, getting a first time license. I believe that I heard that that might be coming forward and that it would be including um, bicycle safety, bicycle awareness components um, and Director Levy. Oh. Yeah, Director Levy, you're freezing up. Oh, okay, good. I thought that was just my computer. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. Let me turn my camera off. Um that should help. And yep. see if that helps. Um yeah, on the yeah, great. Uh no, I wondered, and I think I think this was brought up at a previous meeting. It might have been Director Spear that brought it up about having um, a tip set aside for Vision Zero implementation, and whether you know whether that might be a more direct way to get at the um, the funding for Vision Zero implementation projects. Yeah, thank you so much, Director Levy. Um, that actually is another one of the actions that we have identified um, in this plan. So is the exploration of a of a regional Vision Zero tip set aside. Um, so I know that that's top of mind for folks is how can we create a sustainable pool of funding that's large enough to um, to actually you know fund the projects that we want to fund too. Ron, I see your hand. Or sorry, that's Director Conklin. Uh, no, Ron Papstorf, please. Good to see you. Hopefully, you're feeling well. I, I am feeling much better this week. Thank you, Good. thank you, Chair Conklin, um, Director Levy. I did just want to point out, since you um, asked the question about the state legislative policy that the board just approved earlier this evening, um, on page seven of the document that was in your packet, there actually is a statement about increasing funding for a number of transportation priorities, including improving safety. So certainly, I think the board in in the past and in this legislative a priority paper has recognized that. Obviously, we haven't brought forward for adoption the update to the Vision Zero uh, plan, but I think that does put a little bit more flavor on the general statement that's in the legislative policy document. Um, and as Emily uh, correctly pointed out, we do anticipate with your approval, at least exploring as we develop the next Transportation Improvement Program policy document for the next four-year TIP process, which, believe it or not, will kick off in just a short couple of years. Um, we do want to explore with our partners and with all of you opportunities to sort of maybe focus some of those resources on specific, more specifically towards safety. It's always been a priority element in our TIP process, but see if there are ways to put even more emphasis on that. Great. Thank you. Director Harrison. Thank you, and very good job putting all this together. Uh, I know it's a lot of work. Um, is and has there been any sort of study or correlation between increased insurance costs for drivers um, in Colorado uh, versus safety issues and crashes, et cetera, going down, going up? The way I and why I ask, and I'm, there I'm sure there probably is, but why I ask is sort of for the citizens to understand by making these investments where over here. This is going to have a direct correlation, at least from a financial perspective. Obviously, safety is is number one. But from a financial perspective, as everybody gets motivated by that, of their insurance costs coming down. Have we done studies on that in the last, say, five years or before? That's a great question. Um, and I, I can tell you that we have not done anything, at least since I've been on board in the last two years. Um, but I, I know that Skylar McKinney over at 
AAA would probably be a good contact to reach out to and have some good insight on all that. And he and I could team up to, to look more into that. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think that that might be something to take a look at. And the other thing, I, at least for, for folks old enough, like myself, we had drivers that funded um, at the school district level. And I know that's probably changed a lot dramatically. Um, is there, are we aware of any sort of programs like that that's still at the school district level or are they all private and the, you know, the, the, the kid and the parents are up to going, you know, their responsibility to go reach out to a private um, school to do all their work, to get their license. Is that how it works now? You know, I'm, I'm not familiar a hundred percent with the process, at least in Colorado. Um, I do know that CDOT has as, as a part of their advancing transportation safety program that they're working on right now. Um, they are absolutely looking at more education around, um, or yes, just driver's ed in general. Um, so I know that there has been conversations around it. Um, I'm, I'm not totally familiar with it. We do have at least two actions noted around um, sort of school and Safe routes to schools, education, and advocacy work with um, with students, and I think that uh, there's there's opportunity for that to be fit in there. Good, and then yeah, at the other level, it's just reducing the behaviors. Obviously, we all experience crazy drivers out there that cut people that cut us off, or this or that, uh, and obviously we've seen that uh, increase dramatically. So. You try to deal with the younger population, but also the population that's in the 20s, 40, 30s, and 40-year-olds who, for whatever reason, are not concerned about other people's safety. Is there any studies or any information that you've heard or seen in, re in regard to how or why that is at a high level, why that's happening maybe more so or less? You know, I, I don't have any high level sort of information. I can tell you when kind of coming back to your insurance um, thought is that, you know, young males um, do tend to have the, the highest rates of insurance. Um, and so that's that correlation. I don't really know what else that says. Um, that gets a little bit more into the psychology of of transportation planning than I'm um, really an expert at, but I have been trying to understand a little bit more about why it seems as though we are shifting in a direction that is very individualistic in the way of thinking and it is not a healthy way of course and so there's been a lot of um a lot of research that I'm trying to look into about traffic safety culture and how can we try and and change that and um and shift the way folks are thinking and I think that um, the one thing that I, the biggest takeaway for me is that, you know, it's our societal influences are multi-layered. And so it's understanding <clears throat> how we can continue to deliver these messages around safety at different layers in which people interact with people. So it may not just be uh, an advertisement or an ad campaign, but it's also going into the schools or it's also going into the workplace. And it's also talking to your teacher, you know, your, your friends and your family members. And it's all those different layers in which we sort of have those different ways with, that we can impact safety um, that I'm learning more about, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a very psychological thing that's not well understood just yet. And that's where the funding definitely help in that area to do that. So I appreciate everything. Thank you for answering my questions. Absolutely. I will make my editorial comment that I make often. Emily's heard me say this before, that I think the, uh, the, the change in driver's ed not being something that lots of people were having took away that shared experience, that shared knowledge base of everybody kind of knowing what was going on, at least of a, of a generation. And the other thing is we've taken away predictability. A lot of the, the old rules of the road and knowing what the light cycles would be and knowing you know just how things function, I, I think as we're doing things now to hopefully long-term make things safer i think we're probably going to have a really interesting period that that that, that lack of pre predictability may cause us some issues anyway my editorial comment emily thank you very much we really appreciate the presentation absolutely great informational briefing thank you for your time tonight yes uh, we, thank you very much
move on to our next informational briefing, uh, which is sure to be interesting, the review of the special session and a preview of the 2024 legislative session. Rich Morrow, you're back. Yes. And Ed uh, Bodrich is here and Jen Castle. So thank you yes. all for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think I will just introduce <clears throat> our contract lobbyists, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle, and um, turn it over to them and, and maybe see first if Doug has any comments as well. Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Rich. I, I actually don't, but we thought it'd be a good idea um, just to give give you all kind of a, a debrief on the special session because I'm not quite sure I fully understand exactly what, what happened in the session, but also um, give you kind of a preview of going into this, what, what we all know is gonna be a very busy schedule uh, session again, most notably around uh, housing, land use, transportation, that nexus. So um, please, Ed, Jen, take it away. All right, thank you, everybody. Good evening, happy holidays. Jumping right in here. So Jennifer and I will give you a, a brief summary of what happened a month ago during the special session, and then talk a little bit about what's likely to come up in 2024. At this point, uh, we know some things that will be coming down the pike in 2024, but it's more concepts than specifics for 2024. But just to review what happened last month, the legislature was in session for four days. The governor is the one who can call the special session and dictate the agenda. The governor um, called everybody into special session. They ended up passing three bills of note. Summarize here. Um, first one is the, the property tax relief. After the failure of Prop HH, the governor wanted to do something to try and address the rising um, home values and try and uh, mitigate the resulting property tax increases that people will be paying in 2024. So the legislature passed um, a bill that will uh, slightly reduce the residential assessment rate. And remember the residential assessment rate is basically that share of your house or your lodging property where you live, um, that share of your house that's subject to taxation. So really, you were only going to pay 6.765% of your house was subject to tax. Now it's down to 6.7%. In addition to that, there is a flat value exemption of $55,000 for each residential property. So um, that obviously is a much bigger impact if you live in a very much lower income community. There are some communities um, way out in eastern Colorado where the houses aren't all that expensive and you take $55,000 out of the value and make it not subject to tax, that's a big deal. It's an assist here in town where our houses are much, much larger, the uh, much more valuable. The uh, deadlines for the local governments to calculate their mill levies have been moved back and all of these things only apply to the 2023 tax year when your taxes are paid in 2024. So it's just a one year change. And then the legislature is directed to come up with the next plan. And they will do that through the next bill that was passed. They created a property tax task force, which is a 19 member task force. You have representatives from local governments, statewide organizations, there's an assessor, some county commissioners, uh, the mayor of, of Broomfield is on there four legislators, business um, uh, folks. Um, they had their first meeting today. Um, once the new year rolls around, they're going to be meeting every two weeks uh, until March 15th. And they are to report back to the legislature on possible property tax modifications. Their charge is not limited to statutory measures. They can come back and say, we recommend, um, I'm just going to make this up, modifying something from the special session, carrying it forward another year. And we recommend the legislature consider um, putting a constitutional measure on the ballot. They are pretty open-ended in, in what they can recommend back to the legislature. One other bill we just wanted to mention, um, Tabor is always of interest to everybody. A year ago, we all got checks sent to our homes. Um, this year, they're not gonna send checks out, but they did make the Tabor refunds flat for 2023. So when you fill out your 2023 taxes on 
April 14th of 2024, you will have an automatic credit of $800 per person. Um, that will be your Tabor refund for 2023. So that's kind of a, a brief summary of what happened in the special session. I will turn it over to Jen now. Oh yeah, a couple of other things that were raised but not addressed in the special session. There was no, no um, non-residential property tax relief was not part of the special session. So that whole issue has to wait until the regular session. And then the senior homestead exemption, which was in making it portable, um, was included in Prop HH, but this was not included in the special session. So the senior homestead exemption will continue on. There just haven't been any changes to it adopted yet. But again, that can come up in the 2024 session. Thank you, Ed. Good evening, everyone. So to continue on and, and discuss a little bit about what we expect for the 2024 session, um, and, and of course, this is certainly not an exhaustive list of all legislation that we expect or all issues to come up or whatnot, um, but certainly we, we are aware of, of some things that are coming. To set the stage a little bit, just to give, you know, kind of refresh everyone's memory of what the composition of the legislature looks like. Um, the General Assembly is going to start January 10th this year. Um, it starts a little bit later. It's a Wednesday. It's going to go 120 days per the Constitution. So they can break before May 8th, but they most likely will not. Um, and then the, the composition... You can see the breakdown in the House and the Senate. These are not changing from the 2023 session. So we will continue to have a supermajority in the House and close to a supermajority in the Senate. Um, and then the governor is a Democrat. So we are operating under the Democratic trifecta. We continue to have more and more diversity down at the Capitol. It's the most diverse legislature that we have seen. Um, and then want to note that we do have three new members of the legislature that are that are going to be brand new in 2024 and uh, you know this has happened because of, of of certain vacancies that have popped up we some of you may have heard that recently within the past couple of weeks i think the most recent one was yesterday or a couple of days ago um there have been a couple of house members that have resigned um so i'm at so we're going to see two brand new members that have not even been announced um, as of yet, that are going to come into the, the 24 session. Also, I mean, we still have the 34 new members that we saw after the election of 2022. Um, they're going to be entering their second year. Um, so they'll, you know, they'll have some experience under their belt. Um, they, they kind of know a little bit more of what to expect, no deadlines, those kind of things. Um, but still, you know, still fresh to the process. Um, and, you know, having those 34 new members, uh, you know, we, Ed and I always like to say it, it certainly can be a challenge. That is a third of the legislature. Um, but really, we like to see it as an opportunity, um, you know, to, to engage with legislators, to get to know them, to really talk uh, through a lot of Dr. Cott issues with them as well. So that's kind of, that's, that's the makeup. Some themes, and these are themes that, you know, we've seen over the past couple of sessions, Social justice issues continue to be a, a, a main theme that we're seeing um, that certainly resonates more in the House than it does in the Senate. Uh, there has been some partisan discourse. Um, you know, what Ed, of course, did not mention from the special session is that there was um, there were a lot of disagreements, um, you know, to to put it in a polite, in a polite way. But, you know, both both parties in both chambers um, some of which, some of whom, excuse me, behave badly. So we are going to see um, a lot of discourse uh, coming into this session, it, coming into this session. Of course, it is going to be an election year in 2024, but considering that you had members of the same party suing each other earlier this summer, that kind of sets the tone a little bit as, as things move forward for 2024. So um, we expect some things to not be Pleasant, I suppose, if you will. And then kind of continuing on with that theme of it being an election year, we're going to see a lot of party line votes, which we did see in 2023. There were there were some, you know, some instances where some legislators did peel off from their parties and and cross to, you know, to join the other side. But I imagine that will be will be more limited here in the 2024 session. Some of the issue areas where we expect some some focus, certainly the state budget 
the state budget this year is not going to be as um, generous or flush as it has been the last few years. The federal COVID relief dollars are basically exhausted. Um, the state is constrained by its TABOR limit. That, um, can't, uh, that's per the Constitution. We continue to have TABOR refunds. Great time to be a taxpayer because you're going to continue to get refunds for a few years. But the state's budget will be constrained. Um, there are more and more tax credits that are being suggested. If the state doesn't have the outright money to spend on something, you can set up something as a tax credit and it doesn't take money away from the rest of the state budget. It just reduces the Tabor refund. So we'll see tax credits in low income housing, historic preservation and commercial building conversion into housing. Um, last few years, we've seen a strong focus on renters rights. That is the ability um, restricting when people can um, evict um, renters and other things like that. Um, there will be bills to make the senior homestead exemption portable. We've seen those in the last few years. Um, my guess is they will have a very strong chance of passing this year. Um, as was mentioned before, there's a focus on pedestrian safety and there will be a bill that's coming out of the interim committee um, uh, on a, a vulnerable road users fee. So anybody who owns a car or truck that is not a very light car will pay a new fee that would go to a Tabor Enterprise, um, raise about 20 million, and the money would go back to the kind of the local governments where the fee came from for pedestrian safety improvements. Um, this would be limited to the 11 largest, uh, most populous counties in Colorado. That bill will be introduced. And then of course, as Jen said, there'll be a number of messaging bills around guns, rent control, and so on that are kind of put out there Sometimes they know they're going to pass. Sometimes they know they're not going to pass, but they just want to get people on the record. Thank you, Ed. Um, and then, of course, we've got uh, the governor's land use proposal, uh, proposal bills with the, the defeat of his, his big land use affordable housing bill, Senate Bill 213, which I know most of us remember that, that conversation from last legislative session. Um, the governor has taken a new tactic uh, this this session. He is planning on breaking up that bill into, into smaller pieces. He's going to focus on three main areas, those listed here on the screen. Um, and he, he's doing a lot more stakeholder engagement. Um, he is reaching out to local governments, um, to other stakeholders as well, too, to, to really you know, get some feedback. Um, now, I, I think it can be said that there is still a lot to be discussed around all three of these bills, especially as it relates to potential uh, mandates. <laughs> and I, I, hate to, I hate to use the M word, but I know we're all a little bit, um, you know, hesitant with that. But there are there are some things that some conversations that need to that need to happen around this. And, and I know details are still being fleshed out. I haven't seen bill drafts on these bills as of yet. Um, but again, as I mentioned, the the governor's office and the the legislators who are running these bills are doing some great stakeholder work. So the, the first bill that the governor is going to, to focus on strategic growth. So he's planning on introducing a bill that's really going to try to align the state with regional and local housing plans um, while trying to be able to plan for, uh, you know, uh, water mitigation, water usage, displacement, um, those kind of things as it relates to developing comprehensive plans, uh, you know, for local governments and for um, regions. Um, and then the accessory dwelling units bill or ADUs, um, essentially they, they're going to create a program that will likely be an opt-in where local governments can opt into the program. And if a local government does opt in, then they are, then they have access to certain financing. Um, the, from what I have seen so far, that financing is going to is is going to look at two different things. One, there's going to be some incentives for homeowners to build ADUs, and then there's also going to be some incentives to local governments to reduce certain restrictions, zoning requirements, uh, you know, re reduce uh, tap fees or certain other fees that come along with building ADUs, um, and and provide those incentives to local governments. So there's a big financing piece to, to the ADU bill. 
And then the last bill, which which really is 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 still being fleshed out. Dr. Cog has certainly been a main stakeholder um, in this bill, and we're we're continuing to have conversations um, with the governor's office and with legislators on this one. This is the TOC bill, the Transit Oriented Communities Bill, um, which is aiming to increase density in urban centers and neighborhood centers, um, and and kind of creating a, a slate of certain strategies for local governments to, you know, to adopt, um, to, to try to really build more housing around transit um, areas, whether that transit is, you know, perhaps it could be RTD, it could be, um, you know, buses, it, it could be, it could be anything. Um, the governor's office has committed to sending additional dollars to transit so that transit can also be further developed um, in this so that there's reliable and affordable transit options for these communities that are building housing or that have housing currently in place. Um, so again, this is kind of the, the governor's big strategy. He is dedicating a lot of dollars to this. As Ed mentioned, most of this is going to be in in the with tax credits. I believe he's putting 10 million into strategic growth. Um, accessory dwelling units, I believe, has 16 to 18 million attached to it, and the TOCs has about 65 million, I believe. Um, they're going to expand the LITEC tax credit and then create a sub tax credit within LITEC that is going to be focused specifically on transit. So there, there will be some incentives, mm -hmm. some dollars that go to you know these three main proposals. I will note that these are not going to be all the housing land use bills that we will see. Um, there's going to be others. Um, probably some that will do other things that, that 213 did from last year, as well as maybe create some new strategies or ideas um, for housing as well, too. So housing is going to be a big issue for 24, um, but we do know these are the, the governor's main focuses um, for the 23 session. And did, did I hear, did somebody have a question? I thought I had heard somebody um, come off mute. We're, we're happy to keep going, but I didn't want to interrupt anyone, so... Chair Conklin, I didn't know if anyone... I would say keep going. Okay, great. One of the one of the other major priorities we're working on, and Jennifer and Rich and I started working on this, I think last March, is trying to get an increase in the state funding for senior services line item. So the the board talked maybe an hour ago about the importance of keeping seniors in their homes and providing senior services. The state funding for senior services line item has not changed since fiscal year 1819. Now remember we had the pandemic in there that upset the whole budget apple cart, but we have been, we're doing a lot of advocacy over the summer, meeting with JBC members, meeting with their staff on multiple occasions, and our request is a $5 million increase. Right now that line item gets, I think about $18.5 million. So this would be a significant increase. And as I said earlier, um, the budget is not rosy this year, so five million is a stretch, but that's our goal. And the figure setting for this will likely be in February. So that's what we're working towards. And with that, I think, Jennifer, if oh. I'm not mistaken, up, oh, did we have more? Yeah, yeah well, we, we have just kind of a looking ahead slide just to talk a little bit about, um, you know, <sighs> Kind of what we expect, not only the session, but moving forward and just kind of some things that are hanging above our heads. Again, kind of this increased discord in the legislature. How is how is that going to play out this year? We've already had those two legislators who have resigned, specifically citing um, one of one of whom cited low pay, but both of whom cited that it, it's it's just kind of a toxic. Um, and I put that in quotes, um, environment at the Capitol. Um, so what, you know, what does that look like? We continue to see the rise of advocacy organizations down at the Capitol, um, you know, certainly, which can be a great thing, um, but oftentimes they are not the ones that have to implement certain programs or that have to worry about funding um, for certain programs. Um, so, you know, certainly trying to advocate on behalf of local governments, regional entities like Dr. Cog um, is becoming a little bit more challenging. It's not, uh, you know, it's not, as sexy of an issue as, as certain issues that advocacy organizations, you know, can can lobby for. So we're certainly seeing that tensions with the executive branch, you know, with the with Governor Polis's land use bill 213 failing last year. That was his first legislative defeat. 
Um, certainly, you know, Ed can attest the JBC has been pushing back against the governor and his budget requests and have been, um, you know, certainly putting into place other budgetary priorities um, outside of what the governor is requesting. So we'll see if there's some tensions um, this year and or moving forward. And then the role of the ballot process. As Ed mentioned, the big issue that was property tax during the special session and what's going to happen this year. A lot of the work that the that the property tax commission is going to be doing, some of which might very well be aimed at trying to discourage ballot initiatives. And we know there's already a few that are certified for the ballot. Um, so what is what is that going to do to the legislature? Is that going to force the legislature to act, to act prematurely, to do this or to do that? Um, so that's that's kind of always an interesting dynamic. Uh, that 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 we watched down at the Capitol, Ed. I think that's all I had, unless you wanted to mention anything else. But certainly, we are open for questions, comments, suggestions, complaints. Great presentation. Before we go to questions, I will point out that uh, since Melinda is not having to give out parking passes tonight, tomorrow she will email out this presentation, just as kind of a a trade off for that. So you will get this PowerPoint uh, tomorrow. Thank you for that, Melinda. Uh, questions or comments? I think that shows how good that presentation was. Mr. Rex. It was an excellent presentation. I always appreciate Ed, Ed and Jen's frankness when uh, when they have a conversation about what's going on at the legislature. It's uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, it's going to be something uh, for sure. Hey, listen, I just wanted to share a couple things with you all. Um, you know, the one if you know the one good thing that came out of Senate Bill 213 is that I think, you know, it allowed us to have us collectively to have a really good conversation about what what our position is related to um, you know, that nexus between housing and land use and the like. And and I think that that's really appreciated by staff because it's really helped us in some of these stakeholder meetings that we've been part of, most notably associated with the transit oriented communities one. That's that is the one uh, bill that we've uh, we've had the most uh, interaction with the governor staff as well as the uh, as the sponsors. Um, so that has been good, and you know, and I, you know, just so you know, also CCI, CML, um, all the all, all the regular suspects have been involved in those meetings too. And I think we're we're you know we're we're singing the chorus together with regards to um, what we believe is appropriate as it relates to. Um, housing bills and the like. Um, there's a lot more to come. This stuff is changing so quickly and, um, and you know, it's, uh, yeah, just changing very quickly. So we'll, we'll continue to follow this. And, and uh, I think, you know, by maybe the board work session, we'll have a better idea where we are going into the session on these bills. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is regard to, and Ed and Jen, of course, mentioned this, is that, um, you know, the AAA funding and uh, and funding for older adults. Um, this is an area that we prioritized this legislative session. Ed, Jen, Rich, um, Jayla have had a lot of conversations with the Joint Budget Committee about possible, um, you know, one-time increase in funding for this year just to offset the, uh, really the ARPA money that we've we've lost. We're really operating this coming year at 2018, maybe even maybe 2019 levels, but uh, yeah, and, but the purchasing power of that dollar because of inflation and everything else is just reduced. So we're able to offer even less services than what we could have offered back in 2019. So it's it's um, it's really problematic, and this is with a with a population that we know is growing within within this region and state. So um, we're we're actively having those conversations. And I really thank Ed, Rich, Jen, Jayla for continuing to fight the good fight in that regard. And, um, you know, listen, I remain optimistic in this. I, I think, you know, we've had good conversations. I think they understand the issues. And um, so hopefully we have success. I will tell you that I think there will become a time during this legislative session that we might ask you all to mobilize and help us in reaching out to legislators, uh, sorry, legislators um, related to this, and um, because we know you have relationships too, and and I know you're more than happy to help. So, um, so stay tuned on that as well, Mr. Chairman. I'll just leave it there for now. I see uh, Director Flynn has his hand up. Uh, Director Flynn, thank you. Um, I just want to go back to the special section session 
for a second uh, to make sure I clearly understand. It is a one-year measure. And so, Ed and Jennifer, that means that in 2025, uh, residential property owners will feel the full force of the uh, revaluation uh, from this past year. To correct, the $55,000 off the top goes away, and the residential assessment ratio goes back up to 6.756. Is that correct? Yes, Director Flynn, that is correct. That is assuming nothing else will happen. Yeah. Um, so but this, this, at this point, yes, that it's a one-year thing. So this special uh, study group, this the study that's going to be parallel with the session, will they make recommendations to this session to fix it for 2025? Yes, they'll make their recommendations are due March 15th, roughly the midpoint of the session. Right. So there will be plenty of time to have a full debate on any of their recommendations. And I imagine there'll be lots of other property tax bills outside of that that task force as well. Certainly. All right. Thank you for the. I just want to make sure I clearly understood that. Appreciate it. Great. Last chance for comments or questions. Ed and Jen, thank you so much. Fantastic job. We are so lucky to have the two of you uh, working uh, for Dr. Cog and for our region. So thank you very much for all that you do and appreciate you being here tonight. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. With that, we are going to move ahead. I uh, just called to your attention a couple of informational items in your packet, administrative modifications to the 2024-27 uh, TIP and fiscal year 2023 annual listing of obligated projects. With that, we are at committee reports and we will start with the report from the State Transportation Advisory Committee, Director Nicholas Williams. Sir. Sorry there, a little trouble getting off mute. Uh, the attack, or I'm sorry, the stack did not meet this month. No report, sir. Well, that's a nice quick one. Report from Metro Mayor's Caucus, Bud Starker. Uh, just as quick, the caucus hasn't met since we did, so we have no report tonight. Thank you. Well, there you go. A uh, report from the uh, Metro Area County Commissioners, George Teal. Thank you, Chair. Uh, let me pull up my notes real quick. And okay. Uh, um, at the last meeting of the Metro Area County Commissioners, um, there was consensus achieved uh, between all members, including the city and county of Denver, that Denver is no longer consider itself a sanctuary uh, city, um, and that none of the other counties consider themselves sanctuary counties uh, in terms of uh, federal immigration. However, it was noted by the uh, mayor's office that Denver uh, would still need to uh, repeal a 2017 law in order for that to be official. Uh, uh, so uh, Mayor Johnson did uh, continue to emphasize work on partnerships across the metro area counties. The counties did also have a discussion about uh, a new law that will allow counties to set and establish a minimum wage at the county level. And uh, that is um, that is largely the top, hot topics of discussion. That is my report. Thank you very much. Jayla Sanchez Warren is not here, so she does not have a report from the Advisory Committee on Aging, but I'm going to take just a moment to acknowledge that the uh, ACA lost a star, our region lost a star, when Kathy passed away on December 11th. Uh, I knew Kathy before I was in elected office, back when she was a, a mayor and, and I was uh, with a group that was using some of their space for an event. Uh, but it was it was my pleasure and I think others to to serve on the ACA with Kathy. Uh, I think she is an example of, of just the, the, the best type of leader. And we are very sorry to have lost her. She won the John B. Christensen Award in 2019 uh, and her memorial service will be in January. Uh, Doug, you did a, a great job in what you sent out to the board, but I just, I wanted to take a moment and just reflect personally, having served with her on the ACA. So thank you all. Uh, moving ahead to the report from the Regional Air Quality Council, Doug Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. And um, first of all, thank you, sir, for recognizing the, the, uh, the great lady that was uh, Kathy Noon. She was, she was special to us, for sure. And I, I appreciate your comments. 
Um, Regional Air Quality Council, we met on December 1st. I'll just mention a couple action items. One was the approval of the 2024 budget and work program. Um, we also uh, took action uh, uh, proposing some additional regulations as it relates to venting and blowdowns, as well as existing pneumatic controllers for the oil and gas industry. Um, that just looking for a place on the AQCC's uh, calendar to begin that public process. And those were the major highlights. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, moving ahead. Report from the E-470 Authority, uh, Director Mulvey. Hi, uh, there was a little bit more activity with E-470 than in the past few months. Um, at first, there was some um, very long discussion about the budget. The key points there is there was a extensive traffic study that's available a little bit lower usage is projected than had been previously, but it hasn't decreased. It's just a lesser increase. Um, the tolls will remain the same. There's conservative management of the budget. Um, in addition, there was some uh, reporting on the next gen toll operations, the construction projects, an extension of the um, large construction highway design project that involves 48th Street right now. And then um, jurisdictional changes with staff changing as well at Dr. C at um, E470 internally. It's functioning very well, however, and we welcomed some new people on the board. Thank you. Thank you very much. Moving ahead, report from the Colorado Department of Transportation, Darius Pakbaz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the Transportation Commission did meet today. They had the workshop and meeting today. Uh, two items of note. There was a workshop on the Bridge and Tunnel Enterprise financing for 10-year plan bridge projects, and the um, uh, commission passed a resolution regarding uh, fee access for right-of-way um, in regards to uh, fiber within State Highway right-of-way. Um, we'll note that, um, well, I don't based on what I've been told by experts at CDOT on meteorology and maintenance, I don't think there's going to be much as far as accumulation in the metro area. There's probably going to be some in the higher elevations, but um, if you are traveling, uh, stay safe and wish everybody a happy holidays. And thank you. That's the end of my report, Chair. Thank you so much. And report from RTD, Regional Transportation District, uh, a group that has great sweaters. We saw one of a, a Christmas, a holiday sweater yesterday at our uh, RTC meeting. Uh, Brian Welch, your report, please. Thank you, Chair. Whenever somebody says happy holidays, you know, the first thing I hear is Bing Crosby singing. I'm probably the only one who, rem no, I, I was not alive oh, in 1942. Great song. Anyway, two quick things from RTD. First of all, we are going to have a brand new fare structure that will be implemented on January 1st. You know about that. We That was adopted back in July. It has equitable, affordable, and simple fares for everybody. The other thing is Molson Coors will once again support zero fares starting at 7 p.m. on New Year's Eve all the way through 7 a.m. on New Year's Day. That's my report for tonight. Happy holidays from RTD. That is awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, our next uh, workshop is January 3rd. Our next meeting is January 17th. Uh, other matters by members. I will say happy holidays, happy whatever you celebrate. Uh, for those that celebrate Hanukkah, that just passed. Hope it was meaningful and peaceful. Uh, those that celebrate Christmas, Merry Christmas. Those that, that have other celebrations, uh, or even if it's just a matter of taking some time as the year ends and we move into the new year, I hope everybody has a chance to, to recharge, rest up, and has some, some meaningful time with the people that matter to you. Uh, with that... And you all matter to all of us. Thank you for what you do for your communities. Thank you for what you do for Dr. Cog. And uh, thank you to the Dr. Cog staff and all of our municipality staff. Uh, you, you do a heck of a lot. So thank you so much. With that, we are not that far behind. It's 845 and we are adjourned. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.